it already. So can you all hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Very loud and clear. All right, let's start our class now. We'll be discussing about John this morning. Last time we discussed about, what was our last discussion? Luke, right? So this morning we will discuss on the book of John. Ulan give us exam on Luke, no? So I'm um, covering the new exam next week with Luke and John. Okay. So on coverage next week for the exam will be Luke and John. And Luke, what are you going to send? Send now, right? So uh, Luke, I will be sending in your email, and also John. So I'll be sending it hopefully today. Okay, the PDF as well as the chapter copy of it. All right, where is that? So open the PowerPoint. Okay, now we're set. Let me share the screen. Okay, so I think we're good. You're gonna see it here at live. Online, you can see the, the screen now. Yes, yes, sir. Good, John. Yes, sir. The gospel of the Son reveals the Father. So this is the main central theme of the book of John. Now, uh, chapter overview. Okay. So these are the literary features. So John will be talk, uh, studying about its literary features, the plot of John's gospel, John's portrait of Jesus, who is the Son who reveals the Father, other characteristics in the book of uh, John. And we will also be studying about its theological themes, as well as its narrative purpose, the historical setting, who is the author, the life setting, and how we'll be able to understand John, especially in today, contemporary. Our objectives are, I will not be reading to you the objectives anymore. You can read that later. We'll just skip, we'll go directly to the discussion, okay? So the literary feature of the book of John. John is very unique. While uh, the other synoptic gospels, they share many common features. Like Matthew, most of the contents in the book of Matthew is taken from the book of, the book of Mark, since the book of Mark is the first book in the New Testament. But then the book of John is very unique. Why? Because 90% of the book of John is unique. 90% of the book of John you can only find in the book of John. Okay, now in the book of John, there is no parables. There is no exorcism uh, experiences. You know exorcism, right? Driving out demons, okay? The key, the key phrase, kingdom of God, only occurs twice. And most of Jesus' teaching in the book of John is unique. Five of the eight miracles mentioned in John, five is unique in the book of, the book of John. Now, many synoptic events are not present in the book of John, just like the baptism of Jesus, his temptation, the transfiguration, the institution of the Lord's Supper is not present in John. But of course, we have many things that are also unique that we can only find in the book of John. So John also includes many stories not found in the synoptics, like, for example, the miracle of changing water into wine, and it's only in the book of John. And also, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, it's only in the book of John. Also, the Samaritan woman encounter. It's only in the book of John. The raising of Lazarus. And Jesus' washing of the disciples' feet. Jesus' high priestly prayer. And the account of doubting Thomas and many others. So these are the things that is very much unique that you can only find in the book of, the book of John. Now, what is the central thing of the book of John? Jesus. The divine son. Shall we all read this together? Ready, go. Jesus is the divine son of God who reveals the Father. The Father. Life. So this is the central theme of the book of John. Jesus Christ, the divine son of God 
Jesus Christ who came, born as human, to reveal who the Father is, providing eternal life for those who would believe on him. So the basic outline of the book of John, you have the prologue, the book of signs, the book of glory, and the epilogues. You have the prologue or the introduction, two books, signs and glory, and epilogue. It's very easy to at least to follow. We all have four, the prologue, introduction, book of signs, glory, and epilogue. All right, now let's start. Uh, you have these characteristics in the book of John, emphasis on the identity of the son who reveals the father. Second, simple vocabulary, but deep theological significance. Third, you have these key thematic terms, life, believe, abide, light, simple words, and strong dualistic perspective, people are either of God or of the world. So you have this dual picture, people of God, people of the world. Now, Miracles identified as signs. So miracles is signs. Mo tong sa first part you have prologue for the book of signs. Kanin signs mo ni mga miracles. Okay, signs of Jesus Christ, divinity, signs that he is the Son of God. So these are the miracles. So book of signs and spiritual symbols. You have metaphors. You have water, light, and you have in the book of John, I am, I am the living water, I am the bread. Okay, and the way, the truth, and the life. So you have the I am there. You have Jesus, I am statements. The motive of misunderstanding people misconstrued Jesus' words. And you have irony, okay? And you have personal interviews, interviews with Nicodemus, interview with the Samaritan woman, and chronologically based on Jewish festivals. You have the dialogues and debates with religious leaders, okay? And the disciples who Jesus loved, a uh, clear statement of purpose, a call to faith in Jesus, the Son of God, and teaching on the Holy Spirit, or paraklete or parakletos, okay? So, only John reports Jesus' extensive Judean ministry. Okay? Only John reports Jesus' extensive Judean ministry. The synoptics are more linear with a single movement from Galilee to Jerusalem. So, uh, what's this? Uh, it is only John who, who reports extensive, meaning he was, uh, was this concerned, and there are much more, uh, what's this, narration of Christ's Judean ministry. And also, uh, the Passover, John refers to three Passovers. So you can just imagine how extensive the narration of, of John, especially on the ministry of Jesus Christ, because he mentioned three Passovers. Now, Jesus speaks more openly about himself in John than in any other Gospels, because what is that simple thing of John again? Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, divinity. So in the synoptics, Jesus' teaching focuses on the kingdom of God and his role as its inaugurator. In John, he speaks more about himself and his unique relationship to the Father. So while the other synoptics talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, John talks about himself, talks about his relationship with the Father. So John is much more intimate. While the other synoptic gospels talks about Jesus Christ's ministry, the book of John talks about Jesus Christ himself and his relationship to the Father. And of course, we have a number of metaphors in the book of John that Jesus Christ, I am, I am the living water, I am the bread of life, I am the light. And John's literary style is also unique. It is characterized by simplicity. You have short sentences, conjunctions, and the style is repetitious. You have also parallelism, you have contrast. Like for example, simple words such as abide, believe, witness, you have you have darkness, you have light, okay? You have a contrast, light and truth, parallelism such as uh, peace. And so these are uh, the ruins of the Church of St. John in Ephesus right now, today, present, presently, okay? Now, this unique style relates not only to the nar nar narrator's comments, but also to these words. Jesus speaks not in parables, in short wisdom, as in synoptics, but in long discourse and dialogues. As I said, the book of John doesn't have any parables, okay? No short wisdom sayings, no sayings, no parables, but uh, Jesus' teaching is placed upon his long discourses or sermons and also his dialogues, his interviews with the people and also with his opponents. So the synoptics relate Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of God, repentance, right behavior toward God and others. In John, 
it speaks more on the philosophical issues of truth, life, and knowing God. So while the Synoptic Gospels talks about the kingdom of God, okay, repentance, right behavior, right conduct, the book of John talks about philosophical issues, truth, about life, about knowing God. So for example, in his dialogue with Nicodemus in John verse 3, you have the red letters there. Uh, it talks about the words of Jesus Christ. So, the relationship of John to the synoptics. Did the author of the fourth gospel know and use the synoptics? Or is he writing independently of them? Until the 20th century, it was generally believed that John wrote to supplement and interpret the other gospels. So today, scholars are divided. Okay, Scholars would say that John was uh, dependent as well as he was interdependent upon the synoptic gospels. So of course, John knew the writings of Matthew and Mark, yet he also have his own interdependence and his own uniqueness upon his writings. Let's go to the structure now. So as I said, you start with a prologue, and you have the book of signs, the miracles, the book of glory. The book of glory are the teachings of Jesus Christ, especially during the Last Supper. And you have the epilogue, prologue, signs, glory, and epilogue. So the gospel has a relatively simple structure. It begins with the prologue. John 1.1 1, 1 says, what does John 1.1 1, 1 says? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This is one of the most unique uh, opening statement in the Bible. So this identifies Jesus Christ pre-existent. God was the word, or in Greek you have logos, or God's revelation who became a human being to bring grace and truth to humankind. So it ends with the epilogue. So you have the prologue, Jesus Christ is the word, you have the epilogue, Christ posed resurrection appearance to the disciples. Okay. was commissioning Peter, asking him, Peter, do you love me for three times? And then later on, God said, Jesus said, feed my sheep. So the identification of the beloved disciple as the author. So John, the author is John the beloved. Okay? And Christ had repeatedly said this. Now, teaching types of Jesus Christ. We have three types. Personal interviews, public debate, and private teaching. Since there is no parables, there is no sayings. So the teaching of Jesus is based upon his personal interviews with a Samaritan woman, with Nicodemus. We have his public debate. Jesus Christ would start with a story, uh, with what's this, with a teaching that would uh, enhance or that would uh, create a dialogue or that would uh, what's this, uh, soothe the, the, the interest of his hearers and also with his private teachings. So you have these three types, interviews with individuals, dialogue and debates with the Jewish leaders. Now, uh, personal interviews. Twice, John describes Jesus Christ's extended conversation with whom? Nicodemus and Samaritan woman. And when Christ interviewed, you know, he followed the same pattern with his interview with Nicodemus and his interview with the Samaritan woman. Jesus Christ introduces a spiritual metaphor. What was the metaphor in, in with Nicodemus? It talks about being born again, new birth, that's the metaphor. The metaphor for the Samaritan woman, water. So Jesus Christ started with a metaphor that provokes interest and also misunderstanding. So they are wanting to understand what Jesus Christ is saying, was telling this metaphor. And then Jesus Christ clarifies the spiritual significance of that metaphor. The same is true with the Nicodemus and Samaritan woman. Jesus Christ started with metaphor, would create their, their, their interest and would explain the significance of that metaphor. And then the episode climax when Jesus Christ identifying himself and an explicit call for faith. And then you have Jesus Christ's public debate. So you have interview and you have public debate. The main part of the gospel contains extended dialogue and debate with Jesus Christ and his opponents. And there's also a, a pattern on how Jesus Christ debated and I talked with uh, his opponents. Jesus Christ would perform a miracle or he would teach. He would always start with that, a miracle or he would teach. So it provoked a response or a challenge to his hearers, then followed by further teaching. And these two and four eventually concludes with Jesus Christ's response toward them. 
often mix with his career. So he would start with a teaching, okay, that would provoke uh, them to listen to him and ask questions, and he would end up again with teaching, trying to emphasize to them the point that he was wanting to, to say. So the debate in chapter 7, John 7, ends with some claiming that Jesus Christ is a prophet. So usually after his, his sermon, he would, he would, as he summarized it, he would end it, and later on, the people are divided, okay? Some would claim that he is a prophet, others he is Christ, but still others would deny him as Christ. So the narrator concludes, thus the people were divided because of Jesus. The division is between those who moves toward him and those who are moving as this away from him. So you have the interviews, you have the public debates, and you have the private teaching. Jesus Christ's farewell discourse in chapter 14 and 16 makes up the third type of extended teaching. What was his farewell, farewell discourse? Especially when he spent his time in the Last Supper together with the disciples. This was his farewell discourse. In this long section, Jesus Christ describes the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, Parakleti, identifies himself as a true vine in which the disciples, John 15, right? He talks about I am the vine and you are the branches, okay? Instruct them on the aspects of community life, okay? And warns them of the coming persecution. So Jesus Christ had his interview, he had his public debate, and he also had his private teaching to the disciples. You abide in me. The Holy Spirit would come. You would be persecuted, okay? And this message is all throughout an encouragement for the disciples to be faithful and to have the assurance that Christ's abiding presence would always be with them till the end. And you have metaphors and symbols. John's spiritual gospel often operates at the level of metaphor. Jesus Christ identified at the, as, at the outset as the word, a metaphor for God's communicative presence. John the Baptist called him as the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ had seven I am statements. These are all metaphors. He's a bread of life. He's the light of the word. He's the door. He's a good shepherd. He's a resurrection and the life. He's a one true path. He's a true vine. Okay, so these are metaphors. And seven I am, the bread of life, light of the word, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, and the true vine. And then you have irony. Okay. Since misunderstanding is common theme in John, irony plays a major role as characters deny or question things. Ironically, are true. Nathaniel asks if is, is there anyone good come from Nazareth? Okay, right? The woman asked sar sar sarcastically, the Samaritan woman, she said, Are you greater than our father Jacob? Remember that was Jacob's well that they were in. Okay, the religious leaders reject Jesus Christ since they knew he came from Galilee and Messiah's origin is supposed to be unknown. But in fact, they do not know where he is from, his true origin. So irony also appears in double meanings, giving, uh, giving words like born again. There are two meanings of born again. You can take it as literal or you can take it as symbolical. Okay? And you have the plot of John's Gospel. Let's, let's start now with the plot of John's Gospel. Uh, the prologue. The prologue is the most profound statement of the New Testament. It is it's very much profound. It is a statement of Jesus Christ's identity, his Christology in the New Testament, identifying himself as the, the word, or in Greek, logos, the preexistent creator of the universe, distinct from the Father, yet he was fully divine. So the term logos has a conceptual background, okay, in Judaism and in Greek philosophical thought. So in the New Testament, the word is a dynamic force, in the Old Testament. Why? Why is a dynamic force? When God created the world, what did he say? Let there be light. And there was light. So by his word, there was this force and everything was created. The Psalms declares by the word of the Lord, the heavens were, were made. He spoke and it was done. The Greek philosophy Logos was used for the divine reason which brought order and unity to the cosmos. And the Jewish and Greek ideas come together in the Hellenistic Jewish philosopher Bello to identify Jesus Christ, the messenger, Logos, as the messenger of God, the creator between God and creation. So you have Logos, the word. In the beginning was the word. God created the world through his word. 
and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the prologue of John is a literary masterpiece and statement of high Christology, summarizing the gospel's main theme as Jesus Christ, the self-revelation of God. So from the onset, from the beginning of the book of John, it already summarizes the main theme of the whole book. Jesus Christ is the self-revelation of God. Okay, some have suggested that you know uh, John quote this from an early Christian hymn in the poetic bits in the Gospel. But this might be possible, and it is a fitting introduction to the theme of this book. Jesus, the only, the one and only Son, is the self-revelation of God, who thought through His incarnation we brought life and light. Okay. Through Christ's incarnation, he brought life and light, life and light to humanity. The Logos title, God's self-revelation, becomes John's shorthand way of summarizing this thing. So the, the prologue begins with allusion to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. The word identifying Jesus Christ with the creator God. The word was with God from the beginning, was, but also was God. So the son is distinct from the father, but he was fully divine. Now, and we have the testimonies to Jesus. We have the signs. The signs are the miracles. See, we already discussed the prologue. At the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was God, and the, and the, and the, and the, was, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's a prologue. And then we have the signs, the book of signs. The signs are the miracles. The first sign, changing water into wine. Okay, the wedding banquet. This alludes to the Old Testament passages where Christ, God's end time salvation, is described as a, as a banquet. Okay? And of course, uh, the Jewish leaders demanded a sign whether he is the Messiah. And so Jesus Christ proved his authority, destroyed, he said, uh, This temple will be destroyed and I will raise it up in three days. Of course, it is not literal, it is symbolical. His body is the, the temple. Three days will be resurrected. So you have the first sign, changing water into wine, you have the clearing of the temple, and you have uh, the interview with Nicodemus. Then the interview with the Samaritan woman, as I said, uh, was this. Uh, Nicodemus represents the spiritual elite in Israel, the religious leaders, okay? Uh, they become, they are, they are the insiders, but then they became the outsiders. And the outsiders became the insiders. The Samaritan woman was an outsider. He was a heathen, right? But then he, he was a social outcast. But yet she accepted Jesus Christ. Okay, and so this is an irony of it. And you have the four, second, and third signs: healings in Cana and Jerusalem, uh, the royal official, in the pool of Bethesda, healing. Okay, feeding of the five. Uh, by the way, the feeding of the five thousand. This miracle is present in all of the gospels. Matthew to John he is the only miracle that is present in all of the gospel writings. And you have the walking on water, the bread of life, okay, and the teaching at the Feast of Tabernacles. And the seventh day of Tabernacle was, uh, was this marked by water pouring and lamp lighting. So Jesus Christ is the light of, uh, of the world. And six sign healing a uh, man born blind. Okay, giving us spiritual sight. And then the Good Shepherd, the teaching of uh, the Feast of Dedication. Now, the Feast of Dedication in Greek is called Hanukkah, yeah, in Hebrew. Okay, this was the, the Festival of Lights, Festival of Dedication. It is in the context of Jesus' teaching in chapter 10. Hanukkah is the celebration for, for the rededication of the temple, especially when the temple was rebuilt after they were exiled from Babylon. Okay, during the time of Judas Maccabee. So uh, this celebration started after the relocation of the temple. And it was finished during its second renovation. Okay. So uh, chapters 11 and 12 serve as transition from the book of signs to the book of glory. So you have the book of signs, the miracles of Jesus. And 11 and 12 is a transition to the book of glory. Okay. The raising of Lazarus is the climax of the greatest of the seven gospel signs. So the greatest of those gospel signs is the raising of Lazarus. So this is the climax of all those signs, the miracles. And it also serves as a preview 
and the ultimate sign of Jesus Christ's resurrection. It is here wonderful, you know, we're going to look at a diagram of it. So it is wonderfully created Lazarus resurrection uh, as the climax of the signs. And it is also a prologue, okay, a preview of the ultimate sign of Jesus Christ being resurrected. It also carries forward the plot by prompting Jesus, uh, the religious leaders to divisively do something against him. Because Jesus gives life to Lazarus, the religious leaders plot to take his life. It's quite irony, right? Christ giving life to Lazarus, the religious leaders wanting to take his life. That through his death, he will bestow eternal life on all who believes. So let's go to what's this? The, the glory, the book of glory. The sixth sign, healing of a man born blind, the good shepherd, seven sign, raising of Lazarus, and then the coming to Jerusalem. Coming to Jerusalem, chapter 12. Jesus withdrew for a short time, but then he turns to Bethany before Passover. He went back to the Lazarus home, the tents dinner, where Mary anointed spit with an expensive perfume. And then the triumphal entry in John has many similarities with the synoptics. Representing Jesus Christ's public declaration of his messiahship. So the triumphal entry when he was writing a doctor, right? This represents his public declaration that he is the Messiah. Of course, this was already prophesied in the book of Isaiah. And many of the religious leaders knows this. So in the last section of the book of signs, the narrator explains why so many Jews have rejected Jesus despite the many signs. He provides a summary of Jesus' teaching. So at the end of the book of signs, you know, the narrator explains why they rejected Jesus Christ. They decided to show that Israel's blindness was a fulfillment of what the scripture is saying. And it was part of Israel's rebellious history. And also it summarizes the Jesus teaching in the first half of the gospel. He has come to reveal the Father who sent him and to bring light to the world. Those who reject them, who reject him, condemn. And those who accept him, to receive eternal life. Let's go to the next section, the Book of Glory. So you have the prologue of the Book of Science and you have the Book of Glory. Story time slows dramatically at this point. Okay, so there's a dramatic, you know, there's like, a, how do you call it? Um, slow motion, okay. So the Book of Science, you have the past pace, normal pace, but then, pagabot na sa Book of Glory, there was the slow motion, okay? The next five chapters contains Jesus' teaching during the Last Supper. It's called the Book of Glory because this is Christ's teaching on the disciples during the Last Supper. So there's this, how do you call it, uh, slow motion, okay? But the Book of Science concerns Jesus' self-revelation to the world. The Book of Glory begins with this private teaching for the disciples. So the book of science, it is to reveal himself. But then the book of glory is private teaching for the disciples. Science, public, the book of glory is private. Okay, the last supper, chapter 13. And you have farewell discourse, chapter 14 to 16. In the farewell discourse, Jesus' final great teaching episode in John. He warns the disciples of dangers to come. And promises them the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide and protect them. So the farewell discourse which follows appears to be modeled after Jesus, um, Moses in Deuteronomy 31 and 33. Uh, testaments in the Old Testament and Judaism. So this testament represents the last words of great leaders summarizing his life, making predictions about future, and pointing successors. So there is the similarity between Christ's last discourse and the last discourse of Moses. You know, before Moses died, he had his last discourse. And the, the how do you call it, the, the arrangement of the discourse of Moses before he died was almost the same as the arrangement of the discourse of Jesus Christ before he died. So during his absence, Jesus Christ sends is the Holy Spirit or the Paracletos as a counselor or an advocate. Abiding means abiding in his love. Love which the Father has for the Son, which the Son has uh, for us. So we have 10 minutes more. 
we will end after 10, 10 minutes. So I want to record this. We'll be projecting this uh, in the Moodle. All right, uh, let's move on. Only the fourth gospel describes Jesus Christ's appearance before high priest. Uh, yeah, this is also unique in the book of John. His appearance to, to Annas, the high priest. Annas is the, how do you call it? Uh, the the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Okay? He has still much influence. And then you have the crucifixion narrative. And then the resurrection. Jesus Christ's resurrection narrative consists of five scenes. Okay? With three resurrection appearances. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. Appeared to... Peter and the disciples he appeared to Mary, then all to the disciples except Thomas, without him Thomas. And finally, he appeared to Thomas also. In Jesus Christ's fourth resurrection, he appeared in Galilee during his epilogue. So the epilogue relates the fourth resurrection appearance. Remember, was this a miraculous catch of fish? Okay, this is the, the last, uh, was this when, when they thought that Jesus Christ was a ghost. Okay, this was the fourth appearance of Jesus Christ. And then they went to the, the, the seashore and then they to Basila and he, he had this conversation with Peter. He asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? For three times, right? Peter denied Jesus Christ for three times and also Jesus Christ asked him if you love me for three times and he said, Peter, feed my, my ship. Okay, now, uh, let's go to the theological things. We're almost to end. We have eight more minutes. So the central theme of the book of John is the revelation of the Father through the Son. Okay? It is God loved the world so much that he sent his Son to save us. Those who believe in him will have eternal life, and those who would not, them. Salvation is knowing God, eternal life in the present. So the fourth gospel is on the present. The Son came to bring eternal life. And this is now available to everyone who believes. God said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Salvation is a present position. Again, salvation is a present position because eternal life is equivalent to knowing God a relationship with the Father through the Son. And you also have the Paracleti. What is Paracleti again? The Holy Spirit. Well, you represent the Spirit primarily as a sign of the new age. In John's spirit is another paraclete who will act in Jesus' place to mediate the presence of the Father. Now, the purpose. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in the book. So God, Jesus Christ, he had made other signs which weren't recorded in the book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. The historical setting, who is the author? does not name its author. It comes close, however, by identifying the author, the disciple of Jesus Christ loved. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down to know that his testimony is true. So Irenaeus, this is uh, extra biblical literature, Irenaeus. In the late second century claims that afterwards, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his presidential purposes in Asia. So this is an extra biblical account coming from out of from the Bible. So Irenaeus wrote that John, the disciple of the Lord, wrote something. He published it when he was residing in Ephesus. That's why the church of John is also in Ephesus. Remember what I saw you just now. Place, occasion, and date, 18th century. It was common to name, to date, the fourth gospel to late second century. So late second century, second century is 200, okay, AD, 200, 200 AD. Assuming it is exalted view of Jesus Christ was a late development in the church, the discovery of John Redland's manuscript, a small fragment of John dated to the first half of the second century. I refuted this game, and most scholars today date the gospel to the late first century. So most scholars dated, of course, the first, you know, yeah, uh, John was the last uh, disciple to die. Okay, so of course, that was late in the first century AD, of course, 100 years. And how do we read John today? We're almost to end. John's gospel is fundamentally a call to decision. Like the characters in the story, Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, Peter, and others, each reader encounters the claims of Jesus and must respond to acceptance or rejection. In the prologue, Jesus Christ started in the beginning was the word. 
that it was in God and the Word was God. He started it from the very beginning, claiming that Jesus Christ is the Word. He is God. He is fully divine. With its elegant simplicity and deep spiritual insight, John's Gospel is perhaps the most loved. So it's called John, the beloved, the author. It is also the most widely distributed, sometimes being printed as a separate pamphlet. As I said, 90% of the book of John is unique on its own. And just the, the book of John calls for a decision, a decision for you and me, a decision to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. So that ends our topic this morning. I will not be reading the chapter summary anymore. I will leave that to you to read. Okay? So we have the chapter summary later. So I'll be uh, sending a copy of the PowerPoint of this and also the chapter notes. So your exam for next week, will I be having our exam on Monday? Luke and John. What am I journal next week? For the, there is still journal uh, for this week. Okay, journal and guided questions. For the next week during exam period, what are the uh, requirements? Irenaeus is a uh, a scholar. Okay. So next uh, to Jesus Christ, uh, John is a disciple of Jesus Christ. He is uh, was this uh, how do you call it? Uh, Greek Greek scholar. You you call it extra biblical literature. It is a, a historical yeah, historical book. He is a historical author, Irenaeus. Okay, he's also a philosopher. All right, uh, any more other concerns regarding our class? So please check your attendance, some Moodle, those who are in the Moodle. Kisa na other day, mag-check sa attendance din. Ano na sa mga Moodle, tanan? Kailangan pa sa Moodle, sir. Here, isa na karoon, 11, 9. Ashera is here, Joshua is here. Okay, please say present when I add it lang. Happy today, mag-end. Ano, check naman mo sa tennis. Katong naalang na lang di rin. Nag-check sa tennis dito sa Moodle. Katong naalang di rin. Sige, Smar. Lloyd, Inwood, isa pa. Kian. Magadan. Mendoza. Basarte, Batitay. Ito na. Ito na, ito na. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, thank you everybody for coming to class. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Thank you, sir. Uh, let us pray first. Let us pray, everybody. Okay. Yeah, stop share. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us this day. And we pray to your Father for the learnings we have had this morning. This place the students, they continue preparing for the exam this next week. Please guide them, the Father, bless their endeavors, be with their parents, and we need to support them. May your goodness be upon them, that they will be able to the do well in their practice. Thank you so much, Father, for being with us, for blessing us the rest of the day. We see us in the love and Jesus Christ we pray. Thank you, everybody, and have a good day, everyone. God bless, everyone. Thank you. Bye.